Hey, product launchers, welcome to another Office Hours, and this one is with my friend David Lieberstein and David's company, Dream Product Guru. Doesn't that sound awesome? Like, dream product. I just, I mean, don't we all want our products to come? our dreams to become reality. So David's one who knows how that happens. Um, he's also a brand and licensing expert. So like, I mean, when you think about a lot of you out there really want to make a product to be licensed, but there's a lot of nuances to that. And David's been on both sides of it and, and worked in within that. And so you really got to hear from him, his expertise in those areas. But first I want to just get to know him because you know, this is our meet David. And so David, tell us a little bit about how you got started in the sort of product launching product development world here. Well, thank you, Tracy. Um, you know, I've, I've enjoyed being in the business world for over 40 years. And uh, I've just, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> I started my first company uh, before I even got into college with my passion of photography. I saw an idea and I created a photographic note cards with little inspirational verses in my dark room at my parents' house. And uh, launched that while I was in college and, uh, you know, I had that for about 10 years and was very successful. And during that period, uh, I had uh, artists that approached me at the trade shows uh, that had whimsical animals and whimsical children. And that's where I first actually got introduced to licensing because companies came to my booth and said, hey, we really like these cute little pen and ink uh, color drawings of these animals or these children and we'd like to put it onto our products. Hmm. And one thing that the next and I learned how to license our designs to different companies. And I actually ended up having Sony Corporation in Japan represent us to their licensing division. And back in the 70s, uh, both of my artists, we had over 20 different licensees doing all kinds of children's products and such. And they were doing over $50 million a year in, in retail. And at 23 years old, we got a, a check for $100,000 for six months of sales that I split with my artists. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. You're like, woohoo. So, yeah. you know, and that's, it's a really challenging world, sort of that art and design side of licensing is actually much more. I think much more challenging than licensing, you know, uh, industrial products or, you know, there, there's so many other categories where there's a clear need and you've got the solution, but there's lots of preferences and trends that happen. And I mean, that's a, a lot harder licensing route. So to be that successful is amazing. It was, it was, a, it was a great introduction. <laughs> so yeah, so you're talking about being like, I'm going to call it the maker side of it, right? So the, the producer side of things and being helping with the sort of why we why you would license and why you would bring that in because you kind of played right in both worlds. In, in that particular situation, I, I licensed the artwork to put on my greeting cards and other products. And then I became the licensing agent for the artists to license their artwork to other companies to put their art graphics on their products. And then over the years, uh, my second company, I had for over 25 years, uh, Wine Things Unlimited in the wine accessory housewares industry. I, again, I worked with a number of different artists uh, more for partly for art work to apply to ceramic mugs and glassware, but also with an artist to, des to design functional uh, shapes of ceramics. Right. And, and, you know, and I ended up uh, licensing the rights to um, characters to put on our pewter figurine bottle stoppers, such as Looney Tunes, Betty Boop, Star Trek, Cirque du Soleil. And then we got into glassware and eventually got into licensing colleges where I had collegiate glassware line. So, you know, I really understand the whole gamut of as a licensee and as a licensing agent. Well, you know, that is such a, a, such a unique experience because we have a lot of people who have gotten licensing advice from attorneys. Like, I mean, that's, and, and while there, it's important, you've got to have contracts, there's contracts involved, you should understand what that is, and you should have an attorney. But to get advice about whether or not it makes business sense to really evaluate, am I going to make money doing this? Is this worth it? Is this going to hurt my brand or help my brand, um, help my design or, or, you know, my art or, or hurt my art? And, you know, that's a big question. And there are not a lot of people with your experience on both sides of that who are able to advise well. So you have people who have only been the licensors all the time and so they have their viewpoint and, and to be honest with you it scares me sometimes <laughs> they're like you know because they have to burn through a lot of people in the process to find the right person to license the right brand to license for Correct. them so and, as a matter of fact I, I took on a client about three years ago um housewares product they had the the fully patented issued um for their invention it was called, it's called a sweater hammock and it's a, yeah. sort of like you know an indoor 
Clothing that's how we met. Yeah. This is how we met because that was a, a mutual acquaintance. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I, contact, I connected with them through um, CEO Space, yep. uh, a week-long uh, uh, you know, entrepreneurial program, and um, through referrals. And I really liked the product. And they didn't want to venture themselves. They wanted to license it. Mm -hmm. So I took it on as, a, as an agent. I went to the Houseware shows two years ago, shopped it around, walked, went, went to the booths that had uh, clothes, clothing racks and drying, drying racks and such. And this is a unique product that mounts in the wall horizontally to pull a net across to the opposing wall above a washer dryer or bathtub. Rather than a line, it's a 24 inch wide netting so you can lay your sweaters out or any kind of hand washable clothing. And, you know, there's a, it was a, I found it was a really important category. Uh, but it, 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 at the end of the day, I found two very good companies that were, had some interest. One company really interested, probably three or four hundred million dollar company. He told me straight out, the VP, they had just acquired three new companies. They had a lot on their plate. And after a couple months of you know communicating with him, he said, you know, it's a great product. It's perfect for us, but it's going to get lost because partly it hadn't been fully engineered. It had we didn't have a working prototype yet. Didn't have hard costs, and it's one item. And he just acquired three different companies with dozens of products. Well, more than that, usually hundreds, usually that they have to assimilate. So that is always hard. It is hard to get a lot of attention when you're in a company that is doing a lot of licensing. Um, you know, basically they know that they don't have the best hit ratio. It's it's kind of like having a large, um, a large SKU count, or uh, you know, just having a large line product line in general. You know, you're going to have some failures in there, and that's part of why you have so many. Mm -hmm. And um, and so yeah, that is really hard to get attention. So let's break that down a little bit because I know the story. So let's break that down a little bit into some things that that are common. So you mentioned that you know they had this concept and some drawings right which usually come out of these agencies that will give you and they i know that they did come out of that where they give you patent drawings and pretty pictures and sometimes a web page and so that you can pitch and then they then they start upselling you on pitching you at the licensing show pitching you at the next show and and getting you getting a booth and like all of these things and so that that's where it that's where it starts and then it expands and expands and before you know it you probably spent the amount you would have to do to buy a whole entire product line and see if you could sell it on amazon yourself like i mean it's usually actually more than that that's what i see yeah, it's, it's a it's a huge rip off of inventors and from those companies out there i really feel that they pry prey on on inventors on uh, creative people because they may not have a really strong business sense but they're really passionate about their idea they spend a lot of time and energy to get it to the design phase and patented or patent pending right. and um and unfortunately these companies take advantage of them and they'll end up spending you know 15 20 30 40 50 thousand dollars which as you say you can start you can venture your own company with production tooling in, inventory websites depending on the product for you know under fifty thousand dollars you don't need hundreds of thousands of dollars for a lot of single products if they don't have a really complicated tooling involved. Um, right. and, and you know how to negotiate with the factories to, to get a lower minimum to begin with until you have your sales happening. Right. And, and this is the thing that, you know, we discovered so often that happens with these companies, but also in general with a lot of inventors, even if they've done it themselves and didn't get fall into that trap, is that they have a design that is not designed for manufacturing production and you know as you mentioned it wasn't engineered for the cost that it needed to command in the marketplace and that's really where it falls into the realm of that now then i have to give them the bad news that they have to redesign everything right. well, and they do not want to spend money again because they spent it the first time right, right. and they well, got a pretty it, picture and it should be good but it doesn't exactly. work like that <laughs> and that's a perfect example going back to our, our, our these uh, clients of mine is that um, you know, I went back to them and I said, you know, this company, it, it, they're not going to go forward with the licensing. It's just going to get lost. And I've talked to all the people that I feel are appropriate. I don't think it's licensable right now. It's up to you. But if you want to venture it, I'll be happy to help you and consult with you to take you through the whole stages of sourcing and through the whole production phase and, and, and launching the company and marketing it. And at the end of the day, they said, we want to do that, but only if you come on as a partner because we want your expertise. Mm. So See, I that actually, was a nice deal. <laughs> so that, that, that that's where you get somebody in to help you, right? I mean, right. because that's more valuable sometimes than money in. So I really believed in the product. I really liked them. I had seen the, the I saw the importance of that product category. And so I did sign on as a full equity partner and we launched the product 
a year ago at the, at the houseware show with the designs that had been worked out a, a from the design firm years prior with some tweaks that the factory made to make it more functional. And literally on the plane on my way to Chicago, I happened to be sitting next to a gentleman that I knew from another area of my old business and he has a housewares company uh, and he's not in this category, but he, we were talking and all of a sudden I told him the pricing on this product and he said, I don't know that category, but he says, I think you've over-engineered it. It's way too expensive because we were looking at a, a retail of like $75 and our target really was 35 or 40 retail. Right. Well, I got on the I got on the horn that night on email to a couple of my sourcing agents and said, hey, and my current factory, can you figure out how to make this simpler? We need to cut the price in half. Yeah. And one agency came through and, and quoted me a price of thir you know, two thirds lower for a very simplified version of it. So we went into the show with the current sample, but I priced it completely differently. Yeah. And Home Depot was interested and some other majors. And then we had production challenges with the new sourcing agent. You always do. <laughs> I'd gone for months and months. And by the end of last year, we had to, to move on to another sourcing agent. We just got our first sample in from the new agency at, at a lower price, less than half of the original one. And uh, so we're just going to, you know, move forward into tooling this fall. And I've sent out, you know, images of the prototype to Home Depot buyer and the other major buyer. So we're having to relaunch the whole thing. So, you know, even when you have your venture and you have everything lined up, you know, here, like you said, Stuff you goes wrong. <laughs> engineer it and, you know, you miss the, the forest for the trees of what the pricing should be, but you have to simplify the design if necessary to hit that target of where you feel it will sell. Yeah. So when they met me three years ago, that's ex exactly the price that I gave them. I said, I think if we don't engineer it and design it to be this price, right. then you don't have, you won't be able to have, make enough traction in the market to be worth sustainable and worth doing a business around. Right. So, I mean, you can sell premium products, you can sell higher price items, but it's a more effort to start that business and do that. And so that's really where, and it also plays you right out of the game of being able to either license it, then sell your brand and, or get into the bigger mass market. So, you know, if you don't start at the right, the right target price, that's really hard. And that it usually it's the design and engineering that holds you back. And as you had sourcing challenges, we have a lot of people who have those challenges here and our clients and, and what we work with here is we do have a source that we we've used for a decade. Um, Tom and I trust here. So if you guys need help with that, we can help anyone on the platform, including our experts. So you guys need help with that. And, but the, the issue that we had just happened to us recently was yet another client who runs into the trap of they had a price, they put a contract in place and then the factory came back and said, oh, we need $2 more per unit on it. And you were already like in purchase order mode. Sure. And so it even happens to us and we're good at this and we usually have that. But that brings me to the third major thing that you mentioned in that. So that's why I wanted to kind of unpack what we were talking about. But the third major thing is all of these time delays. When you take this long in the process. And like you said, it took that company three months to tell you that they didn't want to license anymore. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So there's lots of time lost along the way and licensing to me, I've always found it to be a very drawn out process. And the longer it takes, the less, the more risk there is that something else is going to come on the market that they're going to just, they're going to think it's too much work and they give up on it from the licensor standpoint. So timing to market is a huge problem in the, li in, in the licensing plan world. And then the, usually the inventors get impatient. Right. And you can't blame them. No. <laughs> and, and, and unfortunately, I haven't come across any agents out there that act as a licensing agent for inventions. There's plenty of agents that will sell artwork because there is an easier thing to sell graphics to, to, to print on or you know, to print on a product. But when you're talking about a, a product, you're asking a company to invest in tooling, in engineering and inventory and marketing. It's a huge, it's a big investment, you know, and, 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 and if companies don't license a product, generally it's dependent on what the product is, but if it's, a, you know, like on the sweater hem, you know, they would have had to put 100, 200 grand into the product between tooling, engineering, inventory, and proper marketing. Yeah, proper marketing is key, right? <laughs> and, and I have a, I have a client I've been you know, working with on the licensing uh, as a consultant to, to, for him to license, and um, you know, and we've been he's been under for over a year, and he was working on it for a couple of years before me, and it's a very esoteric um, 
frying pan that collects grease, that just collects grease. Um, it's a grease collector, but yeah. uh, different than what's out there for the big uh, uh, industrial type. But you know, it's just so challenging uh, to find the right company where your product fits their product uh, portfolio. Right. Number one. Number two, do they have a, a program in place to work with an inventor on a licensing basis? Because you don't want, an inventor doesn't want to show his, you know, his pearls to a potential custom, uh, a licensee if they don't have a licensing program. He just gave away his idea. Yep. And most ideas can be engineered around. Even if you have a patent, it's all, it still comes down to first to market. And yes. you have a year or two advance before somebody, if it does really well, somebody's going to find a way to get around that patent often and do their own version of it. So you only want to show your, your design, your idea to a company that has a licensing program in place that they have a, 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 a format to go through and somebody to work with directly that manages that. And um, Because otherwise this is also a drag on the timing and system. Because when you have a company who doesn't do it, they're like, well, do we have an attorney that we can call on this? And like, and so it'll drag out the time even more. Yeah. And then also you get, um, you get, I call it the not invented here syndrome. And so the internal teams are like, well, this is devaluing us. So let's, let's right. make sure that it doesn't succeed. And so they actually undermine the licensing. So it is not a great idea to be approaching a company unless you've worked for them before, you have a track record with them or personal relationship with them or someone on your team does. Cause that's what happens to it. And so you'll just find out months down the road that it's not working out. And you know, the, the, the inventors that, that do get a successful license that have a good product. And like I tell the inventors, you know, the average royalty these days is only 3%, 3 to 5%. You only get more, you get 5 to 7% if your product has already been in the market, it's proven itself, it already has a track record, and then you license it out, they'll pay you a bit more. But at 3% average for an invention, you know, even a million dollars of sales, which is a hit run for most companies, is thirty thousand dollars. You're not going to be able to support yourself fully on that unless it's a hit run that hits that, that's a five or ten million. So the the, the inventors. Well, and in seven out of ten well. consumer products fail, right? So you're talking about yeah, you only have a thirty yeah. percent chance of success. Like that's not good. So uh, what I tell people, like I I know I know a couple of inventors where you know they have a number of inventions that are licensed, and one one product they might make. 5,000 a year, one they might be 50,000, one they might make nothing on, but they have a number of, of, of inventions that are licensed because they're like very, they're a very creative person. So they've got lots of inventions, lots of patents, but someone that generally speaking, most inventors will have one really great idea. Yep. And so I, I often say, you know, even though it, inventors think that it's an easier way to go to find that perfect in company, license it out and sit back and collect the passive income, yeah, if it works really well. But again, you're talking about timelines. Let's say you find the right company. It might take six to 12 months to go through the, step, the steps or longer to find the company, negotiate the licensing deal, and then they would go on the run. Once the licensing deal is closed, it may be a year, 12 to 18 months before it even hits the marketplace because it has to go through their product cycle. Right. Then once it's, on the, once it's in the marketplace, most products take six to 18 months to get traction. And beside, and be, and in addition, beyond a small advanced royalty that you hopefully will be able to negotiate, which is if you're lucky, you'll get five or ten thousand. Very rarely that, but that's about as much as you can hope for. Um, you know, you're looking at two or three years out before, it, if it hits well, before you're going to start making some serious money. So, <laughs> so, know. and I can say this. So, Tom and I have 37 patents, and um, you know, many of them we developed with companies and with brands. So, you know, to say we invented them outside of it and then went into a company, that's not true. Um, but we do have some that were like that. But the reality is, is that with the exception of the products that we sold directly ourselves or we invented for our own company and own brand to bring to market, that you know, we have lots of successes, but they're mixed. And the the ones that did the most volume where our biggest hits run had the least uh, royalty on them. And so, you know, even at the end of the day, so I think our best product, and we had what was considered to be a platinum record product, sold $20 million at mass market retail a year. Um, and it was only one SKU. And, it, you know, so there's like lots of low complexity to it. So it was really easy to manage and everything. But that single SKU would, you know, yield us Two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars a year on average. So you know, it was like barely one percent, right? Right, right. 
and is and, and even I mean you're and you're very fortunate that you had that kind of a hit run. That's right, and we we had it for five years, which is really a long time in, in mass market for us to get that. So you know you think about that, and you're like, wow, those metrics are great, but I can't tell you how many did thirty thousand dollars a year, like you know, probably the bulk of what we did during that time period. And, and it really was only the fact that we worked on so many projects with so many clients and had so many in that it could make sustainable income for us. And so many, many times we wouldn't be making, we wouldn't be making a living off of our fees that we charge cl certain clients. We would be making it off our royalties um, that of things we designed two years earlier. Right. And so, you know, because that's how long it takes. And so it you can't start up that way. No design firm could. So, you know, as there is really that hard place for an inventor as well. It's like, it's great, but you may not get that windfall to start this like invention brand of all these great ideas you have. You may not get it so that you could sustain your, you know, your business or your growth of being able yeah. to do that. And also as you, as you, and as you know, once you license your idea to a company, uh, even once they, you know, Hope, you're hoping they're going to put it through the pipeline and get it out there when they say they will. There's no guarantees, and you don't have any leverage on them about that. And secondly, once they have it in the, pro, in the, in the pipeline, you know, if it doesn't just take off on its own accord, how do you have no control over how much time and money they're going to put into marketing the product and pushing it. So okay. this is this is one one of the reasons that Tom and I ventured out and decided to take you know matters into our own hands was because we would see that it was like we would do these great designs and they were amazing and these products should have made it to market but the company didn't market themselves mm -hmm. properly and this was back before the internet so I mean it was even older than that and so and they weren't marketing themselves well there was no way they were ever going to make it so we didn't make back our investment and our time to having designed for them and so we actually started putting in a criteria over the years where we don't design for companies that don't already have a sales channel because it proves that they can market something and we've expanded that in the last few years because there are Amazon sellers who have great understand the market dynamic, have great marketing programs, have things in place, direct response or whatever they might, however they might do it. But the marketing piece they have down and they practice that they just don't have as great a product as they could. And so now we can come in and we can help them with that. So, you know, I see that it's, it's a different world nowadays where you can, where you could, where you can make it work, but that marketing piece is actually should come first, <laughs> which is so crazy. Right. When you think, cause you're such idea product people, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's also why I encourage my clients and potential clients that if at all possible, you know, get, get the capital from savings, friends or family, do the, do the numbers, do the math to see what, what this is going to cost to produce it. Maybe it's only $5 a unit and you only have to buy 3,000 units. That's $15,000. And maybe the tooling is only $1,000. And a website is three to five grand. I mean, so maybe it's only 25, 30 grand. You need to get this going plus marketing costs. Uh, and that might be very attainable for you so that you're, completely in charge of your of your future and your potential earnings rather than hoping that this company is going to do something with it. Right. And that's the thing is hope is not a plan here. That's right. what the product launch has it. You know how I feel about that, David. So hope is not a plan here. And you know what? There's so many things nowadays where we find that there are factories that are very, very comfortable with small minimum runs. There's disruptive technologies like 3D printing, as you know. Um, there's a whole bunch of, of whole bunch of technologies that we can utilize if we're doing textiles or materials and getting minimum and low runs on those. So you don't even have to take that big a risk in the early days. And there's a whole bunch of uh, marketing strategies on which you sell a product that's not quite exactly your invention, just so you can test your marketing vehicle and make sure you test the sales. And then you have a little like fan base. So you don't have to market to your friends and family. You might be able to market to your fan base to pre-sell something. Mm -hmm. And you could maybe make your first run doing that. So there's lots of these ways to be able to make that work. We've got a few of those on the office hours. So I just want to remind people that they're there. We've got a whole episode on small minimum, um, small order quantities and minimum runs and manufacturing concerns that Tom Hazard has done. And we also have one on prototyping. And so if you're, you know, if you want to there are, we can do low runs um, in prototyping mode with digital technologies and, and um, disruptive technologies. So if those are your concerns and you're seriously thinking about what David's suggesting here, and I, I think you should, that there are also alternative ways to keep that cost down to that under 30,000 metric for you if it seems like it's not. So that's definitely time to get in touch with the rest of the experts on the platform here, please. 
So David, back to what you were talking about. I want to talk a little bit about what's changed over time. And so you can kind of give a like this, there's still this, I'm going to call it old school mentality about what licensing is like. And you've sort of given us the reality of the new pictures, but can you, can you kind of, in a sense, bullet point that for us? Like, you know, this is the way it used to be. You have a myth about this perception and this is reality of how it is. So like licensing is fast and it's really not. <laughs> so like, you know, what are some yeah, of those that's things? That's a good, a good question. I mean, I have a, a, a really a good relationship with a, with a licensing agent out of Chicago and he's been in the business over 35 years, primarily licensing artwork to put on products. Right. And I, I saw him at the licensing show last year and I've seen him at the houseware shows and he said that the business is so, has changed so much in the last 10 or 15 years back in the, in the eighties, nineties, you know, he could get a license, he could get licensing deals all day long at 10% real royalty. And the deals would be good for three to five years. Nowadays, it, you have to work, he says, you have to work so hard to even get one deal on a, on a really good artist that's well known and, uh, and a very low royalty, three to 5%, even on artwork. And, and the, the sales cycle is much quicker now because people are so you know, ADD about what they're interested in, uh, the, both the consumer and the retailer, retail, the buyer for the stores, that a, a product may only have a life cycle of six to 18 months, where in the past it was five to 10 years. So it makes us all have to be much more creative. We're coming up with a product that is very simple, generic, and has a, a evergreen potential. Uh, so that's one of the, those are a couple of trends that I can see addressing what you just mentioned. Wow. You know, and that's significant. So my mom is an, a fine artist and she's been approached by many, many licensing agents over time. And I keep looking at the numbers and I'm like, mom, it doesn't make sense because of just what you said. It doesn't make sense that you would spend your time and do this because you make, she's in a big art gallery. We have Laguna Beach is a big art community out here. And she just was in this very, she's going to be all summer in the art affair, which is a very, very big deal out here. And, um, and so, and they, they actually warned them that they would get approached by these unscrupulous agents that mm -hmm. come through um, and they won't get deals and they, you know, try to get signing fees and like, which you should never do. <laughs> so yeah, David's like, no. <laughs> yeah, you should never, ever as an inventor artist pay someone for the opportunity to make money with your design or your idea. You know, they they should only receive money uh, as a, as a percentage of the royalty they receive. And uh, there may be an up, there may be a, a consulting fee involved or some upfront, you know, faith money because they don't, you know, an agent that's working on a royalty basis on a percentage of the royalty, you know, he or she can't put a whole lot of time into your, your program without some type of compensation. So there may be a minimal amount up front, but it's not, you know, pay us and we'll pitch it. That's not the good way to go. Yeah, um, no, I'm so glad you said that. Cause I, I really wanted to be clear on that. There, there are sometimes consults and I think there, there should be because there's like an evaluation standpoint, prepping materials and really getting, you know, the, the program in. And there's a lot of time put in before you ever sit, sit in front of someone to, to talk licensing. Right. Um, and so, yes, that should be there. But to be able to say that that's like ongoing month after month after month, that is not the way to go. Right. And, and also, you know, it, like for your mother as an artist, if her artwork is uh, is unique enough to the extent that it would translate onto putting onto coffee mugs or tote bags or uh, apparel or things like that. Um, there are age, there's there's a handful of agents out there that, that I'd be happy to refer you to. If one yeah. in, in, yeah. I'm not so sure she. I mean, I, her work is amazing and beautiful, but it's yeah. abstract, and yeah. and so it's I think which, yeah, which is harder because they're true. looking for more whimsical things, more illustrative things. I see that on you know when you have merchandising, as you call it, like when you spread your art on merchandising, it's just not in that world. So the best that you can do is do like you know you go to Home Goods and you buy you buy paintings there that you put on your walls, and they are done by artists. Mm -hmm. It's not like some machine did it somewhere, right? They're reproductions of someone's fine art, and they were licensed or the purchase rights were purchased from someone. Um, that's probably the world she falls into yeah. um, mm -hmm. for her particular style. But but it is important for people to realize that there is that out there that those those that that difference has happened over time, and the margins are going down. And yeah. so here's something else. Then I kind of I think is also a myth is so people used to say that um, oh it was just uh, minimum guarantees were easy to come by. So like you know, we're going to sell 10,000 of your units. And if we don't, then we're going to pay you for that. Right. 
it goes the other way when you try to license Disney or <laughs> Universal, Trolls, whatever you want to do. They're going to charge you. Collegiate is one of the bigger ones. Yeah, yeah. They charge, a, and, and it's like, it's hard on the college licensing because you have like a different, um, USC charges a different amount than Yale does. Like it's, it's crazy as, as to figuring out what package you're in, but it'll cost you over time and all those minimums to each of the colleges too. So that's there from that side, but you don't get to command that on your side typically, right? Right. I mean, when I was, we were a licensee with colleges, with all the, with, we had 25, 30 colleges on our products. And yes, we, you know, with, uh, um, University of Texas, University of Florida, they were a higher minimum guarantee annually than other ones. But, you know, there's a couple of key companies that act as a fiduciary for all the different uh, colleges. So it sort of streamlines it. If anybody wants to, you know, venture on themselves and, and get into collegiate, I definitely consult companies on how to do that whole process. Um, that, um, but, but as far as, you know, when you're negotiating a, a contract for your own product, uh, you absolutely want to try to negotiate the most possible advance guarantee because yep. they're, so, they're showing some faith money. And also you want to try to uh, negotiate a minimum guarantee per year. I was working on, uh, you might remember Abraham from CEO Space. I talked and, to him a few weeks ago. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, he, was, he was the other, the one other, another client that I took on a couple of years ago. Uh, we made a connection through CEO Space. I really liked him. He's a young guy. I wanted to support him. And I took him on as a licensing agent. And I went to the licensing show, the houseware show. And uh, at the houseware show two years ago, I found a company, mid-sized company, about $20 million company. Loved the concept of his spin cup, and uh, which rotates a design on a, on a, a double-walled acrylic uh, mug, like a beverage glass, like you see at Starbucks, uh, with solar power. Really cool. And they had a patent pending and everything. And this company loved it. They had all they had hundreds of licensed characters uh, for, uh, you know, uh, over uh, Overlord and 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 Legends of the Legion, Legion of all, all the all the games, all the video games and and, com, com, and Marvel and all this stuff. They had Marvel, yeah. And um, it took me with and he had a and, and the owner had a licensing agent that he'd used for years to help him negotiate deals. He hadn't negotiated a deal with an inventor before. He's always just done the artwork. It took us a year and a half to finally get a deal. That was March in the uh, 016. And by May 017, I finally got a contract with them. And when they sent me back the contract that we all agreed upon, which was minimum guarantees for five years, advance, et cetera, they had changed it to a 10 year. There was nothing, there was no guarantees or advances for the first three or four years. And there was no guarantees or anything that would that they wouldn't shelve it. And I said to my client, I said to my client, to Abraham, you know, and he had some partners. I said, you know, you can do this, but there's it, you're just giving away your idea, and it could be shelved. Oh, and be down, these down things the happen exactly. So, and so, you know, yeah. I, I, and I had a conversation with their agent, and she said, you're absolutely right. This should be a very simple, clean deal. It should be a five year with a proper advance, a proper advance and guarantees. And at the end of the day. Um, they felt that they would, didn't want to go forward with it until the patent was fully issued. Mm. Because they said to me, you know, it's going to take us a year and a hundred grand plus in development costs and mold costs, et cetera, and to translate into our, with a plus our, all of our designs and get approvals from all the licensees to put their designs on it. And they, they put on the back burner until the patent got fully issued. So, you know, that's a deal to me. It took me a year and a half of my time managing it, you know, ongoing to keep it going. And at the end of the day, I was Nothing. not complicated because I didn't feel it was appropriate to ask him because I was going to get a nice piece of the pie. The pie didn't happen. Yeah, the yeah, this, the this stuff happens. Issued. The patent hasn't been issued, and the whole project is ba basically backwarded. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, and so I'm a big proponent, and I know you are too, of, of getting started because, you know, some cases, all that time, you could have proven – you could have killed it yourself if you thought it was, if there wasn't a market on it, or you could have proven and created a demand for it. They didn't know. Exactly. So Abraham's a really good example. So I had said to them, and it, it was a low amount. I had quoted to them I, 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 under $20,000, I think for, to make a couple thousand piece run or something like that, that I was, you know, able to figure out the pricing from some of my factories that we, we would sort of make a hybrid. So a little more labor involved and a higher per piece cost 
but you're testing the market, so it's worth it, right? So you just, you know, and you know what you can do in, in production. But to do that and create like an event where you basically sell out of these 2,000 pieces all because you put them on display at a, you know, big surfing show that happened in San Clemente or something like that. You know, you just, you figure it out an event and you create a, a, a traction for it. And then somebody's going to go, I can't walk away from that. Oh, and look, there's already press on it. And there's, you know, so you kind of create your own hype and demand on it from making a run. Plus you learn a whole lot about the things like, is it really going to be mass produced? Am I really going to be able to do it in the way that I thought I could? Or do I have to re-engineer something? Or am I going to be able to get the cost down? And you, you're going to learn some things on this process that is really going to inform you. And so I know we're both bigger fans of that because you can, it makes your job easier and that you can command a better deal, but you can also command a faster deal, which is really critically important in today's world. If it's only a 16, six to 18 month life cycle that you're seeing on the artwork in product, it really, I really see it as 12 to, eight, 12 to 18 months is typical. It's a little bit longer only because it takes longer to get into the marketplace. So they've spent it, spent an investment. So they usually give it a full year, but even still, you know, for, to get something that's going to last beyond that, um, or make you more than your minimum guarantee is slim. And so to be able to command more because you have proof so much better. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, I know why you've been doing some things on your own. And so do you, tell us a little bit about some of the products and, and stuff you're working on, on your own. Cause you've got some cool stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Um, one of my, uh, yeah, I, I, one of my early clients, uh, four or five years ago, uh, got me of all places into the funeral industry. Uh, they had seems like up, an odd choice, but yeah. Know, it's a mutual friend. Uh, my, my client had come up with this, she and her husband owned a couple of veterinary clinics and she came up with this idea of a, of a, of a product to go in the garden to grow a tree. Uh, with the remains of, the, of your pet and you grow a family tree from a couple seeds and she found it was already being manufactured or she started exploring it, it, it over in Spain and one thing led to the next and she realized it was out of her wheelhouse to negotiate with a factory and import so she hired me as a consultant I worked with her an hour a week for six months and uh, ended up working directly with the factory and FDA and everything to negotiate to get the first container in uh, this product called the BIOS urn and um, uh, as it turned out she wanted to just market directly to pet consumers online and didn't want to deal with the wholesale leads. And I said, well, I don't know the industry, but I know wholesale. I've been doing it for 30 plus years. I'll do that on a commission basis. So over a couple of years, just part-time, I followed up on the leads that were coming in and I, I put it, I got it established, maybe 150 different funeral homes and such and distributors. And uh, people loved it, but it didn't sell through that well. So I parted company at the end of 015 because I wasn't making much money. But I thought that is such a great concept. What would make this sell better? I thought, let's give people a real tree which I, rather than seeds, which I told her early on. And maybe if we make it portable, because if you don't own a home for, for decades, if you, you know, going to move every, people usually move within 10 years, you're not going to dig up grandma or Fido out of the backyard. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that doesn't seem like the most viable solution, right? <laughs> so I came up with this idea of a, of a lovely uh, ceramic pot with a bonsai tree so that you can uh, keep the cremains of your family member, person or pet, in a portable fashion, whether you have a home or a condo or an apartment with a, a bonsai a tree or any type of plant or flower arrangement to go in the center. And the design of the shape of the pot doesn't look like death. It doesn't look like the standard urn. So I launched the bons, bonsaiurn.com uh, in January and I've been in a couple, two major trade shows in that industry and um, just beginning to, to get traction that people love the concept. And, uh, but it's been a whole journey of um, my going through my, uh, getting my first patent, product engineering, you know, the, the, the engineering was done incorrectly and that we lost about six months because the, the, the volumetrics were wrong. And, um, you know, uh, <laughs> there's so many things that can go wrong, right? That's why you're all are here. Product launch hazards, because there are a bunch of them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, so I, and I tell, I tell my clients, once you launch your product, or service, it takes two to three years to gain full traction and make a living at it if it's going to succeed. But because I know what I'm doing, I've done this for so many years. I've had, you know, with wine things, I was doing five million a year, plus the, a sales agency and such. You know, I've done tens of millions of dollars over the years. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to get this done in two or three months. Well, reality is reality. <laughs> and it takes time for a product, no matter how good it is. It's, we have the bonsai earn on a number of websites that sell earns, but it's one of hundreds of thousands of items how do we get the uh, people to know about it? So it just takes time for social media and advertising and marketing and people getting 
confidence in a product. Brand awareness to kick in. That. Yeah. So, so, you know, even the experts launching their own new product company. Uh, That's it, right. It, it takes patience and perseverance and positive expectancy. That's what I tell everybody. That's on my website. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Absolutely. So I want to mention to everyone who's listening that there are related articles to this interview with David because I have featured both the original uh, uh, urn that you, um, what was it called? The, the bonds I earn. And the no, the, not the bonds I bio earn. BioCern. Yeah, that one was, there was an article featured about that, that I wrote for Inc. a while back. And then there also is my interview with you where we actually talk a little bit about the spin cup and that story of Abraham's and actually in that article as well and Abraham's view on it. And then there was a follow up that I did with Abraham a little bit later where he gave a input onto another article. So there's like three licensing related and, and the BioCern, they're, they're, they're all in there. So I want to make sure you guys check those out because you can read a little bit more depth into the story on um, that David's been telling here today. So, so David, what do you think the um, the biggest burning question, the biggest hazard <laughs> out of all the things that you work on that that derails these projects that that gets great products to be unable to make it to market? What do you think the biggest one is that you've seen over the years? Hmm. Or a couple of ones, because yeah, it's so hard I, to put your finger on one sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I would say timing and patience. Timing and patience, interesting. Because it is a lo much longer lead time than people think. Yeah. Uh, certainly, money is an issue if you're going to launch yourself. You know, you need to have the capital, whether it's twenty-five grand or fifty grand or a hundred grand. Yeah, you know, and and that can hold definitely hold up projects. But I think the biggest issue that people just lose confidence, faith, because they don't have the patience and the passion. And you have to have, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to have positive expectancy. Yeah. You have to temper that with the reality of the marketplace. Just because you think it's a good product, if it's going to be priced at twice what it should retail for, and nobody's going to buy it, and you look what else is on the market, like we talked about the sweater hammock, nobody's going to pay $75, $80 for, a, you know, there are stuff out there, but you're not going to sell it. I got a hanger. <laughs> it's like, so, yeah, there are choices yeah. on how they spend their money. Exactly. So you, you need to temper positive expectancy with what's real in the marketplace. But if you have a, a product, an idea that you see has a niche and you, and you want to find, you want to find a unique niche where you're not duplicating what's out there, but something that's, that has a different twist to it, a different niche, you just have to be patient. And know that the timing is going to take longer than ever than you think it's going to take. And you know, unless you have the experience of doing this yourself, bring in the experts, include that in your budget because it's going to help you save a lot of time and money, and a lot of you can learn on the job, and you'll make lots of mistakes that can be cost over two or three years. Whereas if you work with experts, regardless who who it is that know what they're doing, whether it's Terry or Tr Tracer or myself or other people out there, there's lots of great people out there. Um, and, 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 you know, it makes a huge difference in having a team that can get you there successfully and profitably and on a timely basis. Oh, well, thank you so much for that, David. And your experience is really so, so valuable. And mm -hmm. that is really what you just said there is that that's one of the things that I value. And that's one of the reasons you were invited on to be an expert here on this platform is because what, what you're hearing here is that if we don't think that you can be successful doing it, we're going to tell you and we're going to either turn your business down or send you to the next to the expert who should help you first. Absolutely. And so that's really what I value about all of the people that are on product launch hazards, hazards, all of our experts here. That's why I put them here because I know they are, they have the same philosophy that they want success at the end of the day for them. Isn't them making a check in their consulting fees and all of that. It's that your product is out on the market and it is selling like it was meant to sell and it achieved its potential. And we want to be, we want to be positively expected about it too. And if we think we can't, then we're going to refer to you to someone who can either evaluate it or give you the help and advice to get you to that next step so that we can come back in and help you get the, take it the distance or whatever is necessary to get it to market. Because we see too many great products and too many great people fall through the cracks of all of these things of what they know, they don't know that they don't know. And all of these insider things that you don't know are going on around you, or you're also falling victim to a lot of that. And so we're trying to operate really transparent here and give you a safe team in which you can ask the good questions and you know you're going to get a response that is in the best interest of you and getting your product to market. Absolutely. I agree hundred percent. I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm here to be of service. And if I can help a, a client, 
you know, have that ex a wonderful experience in our lives to have a positive experience and launch our company successfully. That makes me feel good. The money is in, the money is secondary. Yeah. And, and, and I prefer to turn away a client than to say, let me have your money, even though I think this is a loser product. I'm going to tell you, I don't think I, you know, this is a great, it's a fun, it's a sweet idea, but I, I don't think it has traction. <laughs> in my opinion, you go ask somebody else, but that's from, from my experience in the marketplace all these years, you know, that's my, you know, and I'm not the expert in every field, but I have a lot of expertise in housewares and gifts and I can, and I work with all, all areas of, of, of product, obviously with funeral and, and other stuff. But, <laughs> yeah, there's lots uh, of little ones mixed in there. So, yeah, well, yeah. everyone remember that you can reach any of our experts, David, especially you can reach them through the experts uh, tab on your membership platform and you'll find all kinds of contact information, all uh, his bio, his profiles there, um, his websites, in the blog post for this uh, Office Hours X episode, for lack of a better way to describe it, I keep calling them episodes, but they're, they're like videos, podcasts, blog posts. You got a little of everything here, so you can consume it any way you want. But in that are all the links to some of the things that he's been talking about, those related articles, to the bonds I earn. If you have a need and you want one, there'll be a link to that as well. Um, so all of that will be in the blog post for this. And so please, reach out to David, join the next call that he's on and ask him your burning questions. So thanks again, David, for joining us. And until next time, this is Tracy on Product Launch Hazards.